Number one, the scenario we lived through in 2011, monetary power was centralized. The central bank became more powerful. That's what whatever it takes means. But in the world we're looking at now, monetary authority is being um, being devolved to the state. So, so monetary policy is the quantity of money in the economy. It's not the price of money in the economy. The price of money in the economy is like your accelerator and brake, but it's there to control the engine and the engine is the quantity of money. You want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Believe me, the governments cannot handle the truth of where bond yields should, do, should be to protect me and you from inflation over the next 10 years. It's very unlikely in a democracy that we choose the tough way out, which is austerity. I like to call financial repression stealing money from old people slowly. Russell was CLSA's chief strategist for 20 years, from 95 to 2014, where he was consistently ranked the number one Asia strategist by multiple polling services. When he left CLSA to make the Solid Ground newsletter an independent company, he also founded the Library of Mistakes, a nonprofit library specializing in business and financial history with branches in India, Switzerland, and Edinburgh, where he and it is based. He's the author of numerous financial books that give historical economic context to the behavior of financial markets and the behavior of financial actors. Russell, you've warned investors over the past couple of years that we've entered a new era that's strikingly different from the past three to four decades of global credit expansion, and investors would be wise to see the changing characteristics and change the investment playbook that was so simple, consistent, and successful over that long period of time. We thank you for joining us today to explore these characteristics, some of the startling data you've uncovered, what behavior we're going to see from governments, and how the, central, the power of central banks is waning. Russell, how do we get into the situation? And how does it compare to times in history? Well, the answer is debt. So uh, as you say, Bob, those are extreme forecasts. And uh, as you say, I've been doing this since 1995. Uh, I don't make an extreme forecast every year. Otherwise, I think I would have been unemployed quite some time ago. So, But the time has come for an extreme forecast. An extreme forecast means structural change. So I think uh, you and I used to uh, tramp the lanes of America together, visiting institutional investors. Uh, and most times that we were just discussing the business cycle. I mean, that's what we talked about, the business cycle. And then every now and then there comes a time when you have to talk about something else. And this time has come. And I think most people in their gut feel that that has come, but they don't know necessarily why and they don't know where we're going. So obviously I've got a clear view on that. And sometimes having a clear view makes you wrong. But anyway, here's my clear view. Debt to GDP is reached an all time high. And I mean, the consumer debt plus the, the uh, non-financial corporate debt plus the government debt to GDP reached an all time global high at a time when interest rates reached a 5,000 year low. Uh, now, it may be a 10,000-year low, but I can only get data going back 5,000 years. So, uh, <laughs> But anyway, in the summer of 2020, it was a 5,000-year low. So the question now is, if we have record high debt to GDP and interest rates go up, what happens next? And that is the world that we are now in. And in a market system, and this is crucial, in a market system, long-term rates should be related to the rate of inflation. So they should be priced off inflation. And that may mean that they have to go to a level which just brings... Uh, debt crisis. So that's what I think is the world that we are in. And then you've got two responses to that. You can either say, well, we're about to have a huge debt crisis, or you can say the government will take extreme action to stop a huge debt crisis. And I'm in the second camp. And the second camp puts me in a world where you basically have to abolish market determined interest rates because of the consequences of living with them. Uh, and if that, is, if, the, if that isn't a structural change, Bob, I've never seen one. Uh, and that is the one we're living with. And it may be coming to Japan particularly quickly. And then we've all got to go back to school and think about what does it mean for capital pricing in a world where the risk-free rate cannot reflect the inflation rate? What does that mean for the price of bonds? What does it mean for the price of equities? What does it mean for the type of equities you invest in? So I have been asked to present on that subject, which is financial repression. And someone said to me, we want you to come and spend as much time as possible. And I sent them a proposal for a six hour presentation. So that wasn't even six minutes. But anyway, that's the scale of the structural shift. And no doubt as time goes on, we will discuss more and more of the details of that. But that's the broad outline of why a little bit of how, but obviously 
it's the why that matters, why this is so necessary. Why can we forecast with a high degree of confidence that there's going to be such a huge structural shift in how even America works, never mind France, Germany, and the United Kingdom? Japan is out in the lead on this. I guess Europe would be next and the US last. Um, how is that going to play out? Is that important? Yeah, it's very important. And just to say why it's in that sequence, I think the Japanese are already losing control of the central bank balance sheet. You know, if you try to enforce this artificial yield curve using your central bank balance sheet in a period of higher inflation, then you can lose control. And that's what's happened. And they, they were doing it in a period of low inflation. And then you get into a horrible uh, negative feedback loop. You create more money and you probably get more inflation. You have to try harder to keep yields down. And, and that is where they already are. And they, they went their own way. They decided to keep doing this as others stopped or even went the other direction. And their exchange rate fell about 40% as a result. Uh, and now they're in this terrible mess. So they are first. The reason for going in that order that you've just said there is if, if I look at where private sectors have got incredibly high percentage of their cash flow going to service debt, most people are really surprised to find that Europe's high on that list and, and much higher than America, uh, particularly France. And the Netherlands and Belgium are also in the Eurozone. And then you've got three other countries, not in the Eurozone, but in Europe, Norway, uh, not in the EU either. Uh, you've got Denmark and you've got Sweden. So that's the reason for putting Europe second. The United Kingdom, as we discovered in September, October, isn't that far behind either. And I think we discovered what level rates can get to in the UK. It's 4.5%, because at 4.5%, the central bank was buying and we uh, destroyed the government. That kind of gives you some idea of a level which, uh, the, the level which cannot speak its name. Uh, and then America comes behind that. We'll probably get into, into more detail on that. So the reason this matters is the history of financial repression is it really all comes on the same day. And that is uh, the day that warfare comes because we need to mobilize all the savings to finance the government to fight a war. And uh, this time it isn't that way. This time it's coming stage by stage. And what should happen uh, and we need to be a bit careful about this, but what should happen is it should have negative effects on the exchange rate. So we saw that in Japan, actually, as they as they kept going. Uh, and capital should leave, a non-regulated capital should leave any financial repression. Uh, but it's a bit more complicated than that because there are also flows of regulated capital coming in the opposite direction. So anyway, that's why this is going to be a really very volatile period of global history, because this time probably... Financial repression comes one country at a time. Imagine what happens in Europe if one country does it unilaterally. You know, France declares a yield curve control. So you've got one mandated yield curve in a single currency and 19 other yield curves. I mean, it's 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 not the end of the single currency overnight, but it's just incompatible with the operation of a single currency. So this is really big stuff. And, it's, and it really is, exas is exacerbated if you do it in stages rather than everybody does it at the same time. The Bretton Woods 1971 separation of the, the dollar from gold, which was the last major currency to separate from gold, was that the enabling factor? If you go back, did that is that what has allowed this to get to a record level? Yeah, I mean, there's more to it than that, but without the end of Bretton Woods, yeah, I mean, that was the last vestige of an anchor. It wasn't much of an anchor, but that was the last vestige of an anchor. It also said to those who wanted to borrow that there probably wouldn't be any deflation again. There would only be inflation and your debts would be effectively be inflated away. So yeah. there was that. It really began, of course, with Michael Milken in the mid 1980s. Uh, and Milken showed that you could go to outside the banking system. You could go to the uh, savings institutions and you could mobilize debt capital from pension funds and life funds. And you could mobilize that to gear up. So the, uh, I mean, you know, as a, historian of monetary and credit, money and credit. That was a fascinating period in history. So yeah, the end of the Bretton Woods made it safer to get into the business of borrowing money. But Milken found a way of turning, of creating non-bank credit. And if you look at the history of the US and why ultimately we've got high debt to GDP, it's the boom in non-bank credit. You know, the, the beautiful thing about bank credit is if, as it expands, it creates money. That's the nature of the fractional reserve banking system. So bank debt to GDP maybe shouldn't get too far out of kilter. But when you add in non-bank credit, then you can get way out of kilter. So that was the second leg of this. So without the end of Bretton Woods, it really, it wouldn't have been safe for anybody to do this. There was a prospect of a deflation. Uh, 
And then there was a prospect of no deflation. And then, of course, you had uh, falling long term interest rates for a very, very long period of time. But then what we discovered in 2007 is they were coming down for a reason. There was a risk of deflation. And then the last, uh, whatever that is now, 15 years has been, fat, been, has been trying to fight that deflation to try and make sure this debt bubble doesn't come home to roost. So uh, arguably, we've been trying to stop this debt bubble from coming home to roost for quite a long period of time. But it's time to end that particular approach to it using the central bank balance sheet and, and go somewhere else. So the monetary system is absolutely crucial to this. Uh, and that's why we live in an important period. We are developing a new monetary system. It is forming from the chaos. And uh, we've all got to try and work out what it is. And there's no point in forecasting the business cycle, in my opinion, if you can't have a strong view on what this new monetary system is going to like. And that was your big call when Bretton Woods ended. That's your big call today. And if you don't get that big call right, I think most of your asset allocation will be wrong. You pointed out that uh, financial repression is the likely outcome. Um, I assume there are two ways out of this, default and debasement. And you pointed that out. Um, debasement, I, as I understand it, has always 100% of the time been the choice of governments in power throughout history. You talked about the 5,000 years. Um, is that statistic correct? No, no, it's not absolutely correct. I mean, if you go back to the Napoleonic War, for instance, uh, after that, ster sterling was not debased and the debt to GDP, government debt to GDP ratio came down. However, I would point out that part of the way we brought it down was by invading and occupying other countries and stealing their wealth. So, you know, I think those days have probably gone, Bob, particularly for the United Kingdom. I don't know about America. So uh, there were historical ways that we did this without debasing. But I don't think, and remember that was not a democracy as well. So when you weren't in a democracy, property owners got the vote and property owners liked hard money. Property owners liked the fact that their wealth was going to be, you know, the purchasing power of their wealth wouldn't go down. So there was a political system as well, which occasionally got us to a world where you didn't have to debase your, your currency. Or you could simply, you know, and, and also the history of governments in the 19th century is when you stop killing people, you stop spending. That is not the history of governments in the 20 and 21st century. We've got plenty of other things to spend money on. So it's really the social political change to a more representative democracy as well that suggests that relief for debtors who all vote, let's not forget, is much more likely than it would have been in some periods of history where we did manage to get out of these problems without debasing. Debasing was, is the most common approach to this. Uh, there have been a few rare occasions when it wasn't possible. I would say it's very unlikely in a democracy that we choose the tough way out, which is austerity, uh, maybe even default. I mean, we defaulted, Lehman's defaulted. I don't remember that working out particularly well for economic growth. Uh, that's a private sector default. Greece defaulted on its sovereign debt. I don't think it's a land flowing with milk, honey and red So, uh, you know, I think that the, the so-called debasement, which is not hyperinflation, it's just keeping inflation that bit above rates, is in a democratic system that is our chosen path. Well, if you wait a few months here in America, our elected officials might call your bluff on that one. <laughs> We're about to find out. I mean, my, my view on that is if they call the bluff, uh, the bond yield spikes up a bit like not passing tarp and suddenly everybody comes into a room and they all change their minds. So you know, as, yeah. <laughs> as, as you say, time will tell, but we could get to that tarp moment again. Yeah. And we, Usually we... Yeah, usually we get right there and then we pass it. But this time might be we we might need the market to uh, to force it yeah, to happen. Absolutely, I think it'll be. I mean, the British the British example is a great example. It was the market that destroyed the last government. I mean, literally destroyed it. We kicked out of office within days. So, uh, yeah, it's the bond markets that bring discipline. And then the question is, do the bond markets discipline the government, or does the government discipline the bond markets? Everybody no. thinks. Yes, by Ryan. Yeah, I was at the, the British Embassy when the finance minister gave his speech and he left the British Embassy, got on a plane and went home and got fired. <laughs> yeah, remember what James Carville said back, I think, in 1994, I'd like to come back as the bond market. Uh, <laughs> so, but what happens if they abolish the bond market? I mean, that's my forecast. And because they can't cope with the truth. You remember the uh, that great line from A Few Good Men by uh, Jack Nicholson when he's yeah, sitting in the, the, yeah. the box? You want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Believe me, the governments cannot handle the truth of where bond yields should, do, should be to protect me and you from inflation over the next 10 years, and therefore they'll abolish the truth. Russell, part of the simple successful investment strategy over the last three and a half decades during um, this credit expansion um, driven by the US Fed is don't bite the Fed. So um, what, 
what is it that, that, that has taken over investors thinking about the power, of the, who's the most powerful in the economy? But you're going to need governments to suppress that in the future. Um, how are, what are those mechanisms? Most people do not understand what governments can do to undermine the power of the central banks around the world. Yeah, so, so, so monetary policy is the quantity of money in the economy. It's not the price of money in the economy. The price of money in the economy is like your accelerator and brake, but it's there to control the engine and the engine is the quantity of money. Now, there are two ways in which the government's actually taking over both. But the first one it's taking over is, is one that's happening and no one's really noticing. Now, this is much more prevalent in Europe than America, but it was prevalent in America during COVID under the Payment Protection Program. So if you guarantee bank lending, and say to the banks, the government says to the banks, you lend to these guys, you can't lose money. And the banks lend money, they create money. The normal mechanism is that the central bank tries to control the growth in bank credit and money through adjusting interest rates, uh, the size of reserves, changing capital adequacy rules. But now the government has jumped in and the government is riding these horses that are the commercial bankers. So that is the first thing that's already happened, particularly in Europe. And that means they have more direct control over the quantity of money. This is called a Credit controls, they were fairly prevalent after World War II. And we did not, did not attempt to control inflation using the price of money post-World War II. We tried to control the amount of money by controlling bank credit. So this is the first thing, and it's an evolution rather than a revolution, but it's an evolution I think that's quite progressed in Europe. The second thing is they can also control the price of money, if I'm right, and the form in which we now secure a yield curve at a price the government wants is forcing savings institutions to buy government bonds. It's the government that determines the yield it wants to pay. And it's the government that forces savings institutions into the marketplace. So the government would then be controlling both the price and quantity of money. And the only realistic question to the Federal Reserve is what are you gonna do all day? Now, they're very good at writing learned papers. So, I mean, I suspect it'll turn out lots of learned papers over the next decade, but that's the, that's the transition that we get to. And I don't think the market's paying any attention to it whatsoever. But as you say, Bob, you know, we've learned for 30 years, watch the Fed, follow the Fed. And, you know, we know what the Fed's target is. We know what they're saying, but nobody's really focusing on, do they have the power to deliver it? Uh, here in the United Kingdom, we had got massive, the government went ran out on Ukraine and gave lots of subsidies on energy. They've now told the banks not to foreclose on any of the mortgages and we're putting out lots of subsidized credit. All of that acts against monetary policy. All that acts to mitigate monetary policy. So there's this war already going on. I think perhaps the general feeling in investors is the central bank will win. And of course, I'm on the other side of that, saying the government will win. It has to win because the consequences of it not winning socially, politically could be dire because of the the consequences of for private sector uh, financial stability. Now, th th that's not taking a political view. It's just saying that the, you know, the consequences of interest rates at the right level would be so dire that no one's really going to let them come to pass. I saw some statistics that you put together about amounts of um, loans to private sector that are guaranteed by various governments in Europe. And I think I saw that Italy was over 100%. The two different, there's flows and stocks there. So if you look back over the last three years, you'll find that the percentage of loans to corporates by the Italian banking system has been at a very high number. I don't think it's quite 100%, but at a very high number. But even the stock of existing, and that's different from a flow, has reached about 40%. It's quite stunning. Uh, a nice little simple transaction for people to have a look at, at online was Enel, E-N-E-L, which is the big energy company. Got a 16 billion euro loan from the banks, all underwritten by the government just before Draghi left power. That creates money. This, this is the important thing. That was a creation of euros, wielding that Italian government guarantee, not commission guarantee, nothing to do with the central bank, wielding this this this. Uh, pledged by the Italian government to pay that money back if Enel couldn't pay it, created an expansion in bank credit and created more euros. Now that's, that's incredible because this is supposed to be a unitary monetary authority. And there was a government directly intervening, surpassing the actions of the central bank to create money. And it's happening all over Europe. One of the most aggressive users of this actually is Germany these days. 
So this is, is actually happening and we're just pretending that we don't think it's important. You know that in America, you have the inflation, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. I can hear people laughing from a distance, but anyway, uh, Europe is trying to respond to that and it's responding to it in a very simple way. It's called an industrial policy. Uh, Schultz and Macron talked about that, I think it was earlier this week, that Europe needs an industrial policy. Who do you think is going to fund it? It's not going to be the government's going to fund it. They're going to tell the banks to fund it. And if the banks fund it, their balance sheets expand and euros are created. And it's not being, this policy doesn't seem to be run from the center by the commission. I mean, the basic tenet of what Schultz and Macron said is everybody has to go out and have their own industrial policy. So what happens if the uh, France wants to grow its bank balance sheet at 15% and Germany wants to grow it at two? I mean, this just doesn't work. Uh, so, you know, there's so much going on here. Uh, and I think that's the real that's the real problem, particularly in the eurozone. You cannot. This is not compatible with the single currency. Didn't a form of this happen in 2011 when the sovereign debt crisis hit Europe and sent stock markets around the world down? Yeah, it, it did. And the responses were interesting because obviously the reason that bond yields would go flying up in Europe but not in the United States of America is it wasn't clear that there was a central, one central banker in Europe who would buy everybody's government bonds. And then Draghi made that famous comment, whatever it takes. Yeah. And whatever it takes was interpreted to mean that he would go out and buy, if he had to buy Greek bonds in, in larger numbers, he would do so. Now, uh, the constitutionality of that statement is debated, I think quite rightly so. Uh, but the point is, it worked. The point is, it did bring these yields down. Uh, we march forward now to uh, to where we are today. Is the central bank still capable of buying anybody's government bond in, in any quantity? Uh, I think for a while, people maybe thought it was. It's certainly been pretty active in the Italian government bond market. Uh, but to me, it's not clear that they actually have got that authority and they can keep, keep expressing it uh, through their balance sheet. Uh, anyway, there's another way to do this now. And that, that's the bottom line. We went through an experimentation period where we believed that only the central bank could hold it together. And yeah. now these guys believe that the expansion of commercial bank balance sheets to fund growth and investment and an industrial policy is what holds Europe together. And it, it, it may hold it together economically, but it bursts it apart from a monetary perspective. So in, in number one, the scenario we lived through in 2011, monetary power was centralized. The central bank became more powerful. That's what whatever it takes means. But in the world we're looking at now, monetary authority is being um, being devolved to the state. So sim you know, different responses with entirely different outcomes as far as I'm concerned. Let's shift back to Japan because you said that's the linchpin right now um, and that we may be seeing a snapshot of the future in what happens. Hedge funds have seemed to take a pretty one-sided bet on what's going on in Japan, um, and that may wind up being wrong. Would you mind explaining all that to us and, and, and why this may be sooner rather than later that we see the impact of financial repression? Yeah, so there's a certain amount of excitement because after 30 years of being wrong, everyone's convinced they're about to be right. So this is the widowmaker trade, as you know, shorting the JGBs. Because most people, when they scenario, do the scenario analysis for the JGB and the Bank of Japan's policy, can only come up with two options. One option is the status quo. And I agree with people that the status quo is, in, is not, cannot be sustained. You know, to have rising inflation and to respond to that by keeping interest rates low and, and an uncontrolled growth in the central bank balance sheet, because that's what it is. You're not, this isn't quantitative easing. This is buying whatever quantity is presented to you in a given day. That is not, you know, that is a road to hyperinflation eventually, obviously not anytime soon, but you just cannot keep that going. Keep it going for some weeks, maybe you can keep it going for a couple of months, but you can't keep it going. So I agree with that. Now, everybody would then say, and I think the people who are shorting the JGB would say, well, there is only one other option then, allow the price of JGBs to fall, allow yields to rise, and then go back to the same policy, but on the basis that people will not be selling the JGB because the yield is so attractive. That's what they think is the second stage. That's very dangerous. Uh, it's very dangerous because of the capital loss that banks might sustain, commercial banks might sustain, commercial banks are geared, so it's particularly negative impact on their capital base. It's also very dangerous for the Bank of Japan itself. It takes a capital loss, obviously. Uh, it's not the end of the world. There's lots of central bankers out there taking capital losses at the minute. One thinks of the Swiss National Bank as an example. It may even move to negative equity, which once again is not the end of the world, as you might think. Uh, lots of banks have had negative, central banks have had negative equity before. The problem is you're locking in a long-term operating loss. 
you know, you're going to have to be offering, let's say they, they recap to 1%, which is I think roughly where most uh, hedge funds think the, the yield curve would go to. They're going to be paying 1% on reserves and their portfolio, their assets is going to be yielding maybe 25 basis points. Remember, they've locked in the yield in those assets. Not really forever, but almost forever. But they're taking a floating rate on their reserves or they're pricing a floating rate on the reserves. So that probably doesn't matter either and for a week or a month or a quarter or a year, but you're locking it in for a long time. So I think this is this is not where the Bank of Japan would choose to be, even if they have a commitment from the government to recapitalize them. That's not where they choose to be. So I think there are dangers in it. So the third one is the one we've been discussing now for the last half hour almost, which is force your savings institutions to buy government bonds. Now, anywhere else in the world, that would appear through regulation and, and, uh, and the change in the law. But in Japan, moral suasion is a powerful thing. That's the way the moth works. It's always worked. Bob, I think you are old enough to remember what happened in October 1987 when the moth called in all the institutions and said, you will buy these equities. And they did buy these equities. Uh, so we could get something like that going on outside of the formal kind of regulatory approach. You get in a more sort of Anglo-Saxon approach to, uh, to, to financial regulation. Now, the, the problem with that one was what do they sell? You know, if you're going to tell these guys to sell, to buy this stuff, what do they sell? Uh, and uh, portfolio managers watching this will have their own opinions. But I think you try not to get out of kilter on your um, debt, to, your bond to equity balance. And you have to sell what's liquid because you're having to buy in some huge size. So you sell other people's government bonds. So that's why Japan may be at the leading edge of this because they're getting this is getting out. This is getting unsustainable and it's going to take them to the next step. And I think the next step might be. Uh, phase two. If it's not this time, it's the next time. And then the reason that we all have to pay too attention it and, and not just say, oh, isn't this an amusing, interesting little thing that's happening in Japan? It's because they would be selling everybody else's government bonds to purchase JGBs. And then we have to work out the consequences of that. And that would cause governments to have to take more action um, as yields on sovereigns rose everywhere. Yeah, it's it's really quite tricky to work out what they would do. They could slash short-term interest rates. They could go to financial repression themselves. They could try and stop the Japanese from selling these bonds. You see, this is not a one-day thing or a one-quarter thing or a one-year thing because you know that these guys are sellers in size, I would say, for about 10 years. So it's a really big issue, and you're going to have to find an answer to it. And I've given you some sort of guesses as to what that answer would be but it's going to be a very very big thing and ultimately in my opinion and i really don't know when it leads everybody to you know that's not the only thing leading people to financial repression elsewhere but it's a good firing of the starting gun towards more financial repression everywhere else the risk of japan selling sovereigns um, is a little bit similar to the thesis when the u.s central banks froze U.S. dollar denominated assets in Russia was that if that did not wind up triggering um, sales, and you don't think that it is as important as something else that happened then? Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Well, I think what happened then, the important news was not that the U.S. seized the reserves of Russia. That wasn't the story. The U.S. is quite good at seizing people's reserves. <laughs> and nobody was nobody was surprised at that action. The surprise was Europe seized those reserves. Switzerland seized those reserves. My understanding is that Singapore seized those reserves. That's the story. That doesn't undermine the dollar. That supports the dollar in, in a bizarre way, because it's not as if, if I'm a reserve manager, I can think, oh, let's just put all the money into euros, because the Europeans would never do that. Let's put all that money into uh, Switzerland, because the Swiss would never do that. So in some strange ways, the, the dollar was hanging out there, particularly under the Trump presidency, when people thought, particularly the Iranian situation, that Trump would weaponize the dollar. Uh, it turns out that everybody will weaponize uh, when it comes to this uh, situation. So I don't think it really has negatively affected the dollar at all. It's made gold more interesting, because it's one of the few places or one of the few assets you could own that perhaps wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be sequestered. So I don't think the, uh, the the sort of situation, the reserve currency status of the dollar has been changed by that particular action. And on gold, you're specifically referencing that if central banks are worried about getting sanctioned and losing access to some of their reserves, diversifying those reserves into more gold makes a lot of more, a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about gold is you can hold it in your own country as well. So if you have, you know, euro reserves or 
dollar reserves, they are going to be within the long reach of the Europeans or the Americans. Uh, but gold sitting in the ground in your own country isn't. And you have to find someone who'll take it in payment. Uh, but the Chinese are working on that. So, uh, well, another thing you talked about in Japan as a as a microcosm or as a indicator is liquidity. Um, so, how does liquidity factor into the growing repression that would happen over the next decade? How long will the repression last? Do you think until things are fixed? Yeah, so I, I, I'm certainly guessing over a decade, more like 15 years, because you have to bring the debt to GDP to a reasonable level. Uh, I can't give you to two decimal places what that reasonable level is. That's the problem. But I think it's certainly going to be a lot closer to 200% than uh, where we are today, which is closer to 300%. So, and, and then you have to just work out the gap between the two things, which is growth in nominal GDP to growth in debt. And then whatever rate you think is sustainable is how quickly this can come down. So... I think the gap has to be relatively small because of the sheer social chaos. If it was too big, you know, if inflation was running way ahead of interest rates, then you can get out of control and you can lose control of velocity, which would be particularly dangerous. So I, I go for 10 to 15 years because I think the gap between the growth in debt and the growth in nominal GDP has to be relatively small. I mean, a 400 basis point gap, perhaps, and that takes quite a long time to get there. But liquidity is a, is a fascinating thing. Uh, I recommend, I think this is probably the world's most boring publication, but I like to read it, which is the annual report for the Investment Company Institute of Washington, D.C. And uh, I, if, you're, if you're watching from that organization, keep up the good work because it's a brilliant publication. Uh, but it looks at the history and the current data for the number of mutual funds in the world. And the numbers are just staggering. So I must admit, I think it was I mean, it's a year since I looked, but I think there are 122,000 mutual funds in the world. Uh, well, you used to be a stockbroker. How many liquid equities are there in the world? I think it's a, quite a few less than 122,000, right? So, uh, oh yeah, oh it's, yeah. I think you went from, I think you went from um, it, it's down something like from 7,000 to 4,000 on yeah. that kind of magnitude. If those aren't the right numbers, and then you go back to the 1950s and you realize that there really weren't very many mutual funds at all. So, what happened? The answer is liquidity. You can run a mutual fund. The whole point of a mutual fund is you deliver, you liquidate and deliver cash the next day. And you can only do that in a very liquid marketplace. So in this world that we're talking about, there is less liquidity. And then the whole the problem is we've structured a whole financial system around kind of perfect and hyper liquidity. And then it starts to ebb and disappear uh, because we've got forced sellers and forced buyers. Uh, and that's not a level of uh, high liquidity. That's driving us towards a lower level of liquidity. And one wonders how mutual funds work. And we're seeing a bit of it as, you know, but in only in, places where the mutual funds are bought very illiquid assets, which is property. So we're seeing a little bit of that. I don't think anybody thinks that can spread as far as uh, debt securities or equities. Uh, and it, it, it probably won't in the short run, but over the long term, liquidity is coming down. So in my, in my first book, Anatomy of the Bear, uh, I looked at the uh, average holding period for equities over, I think, over 100 years. And in that period after World War II, it was roughly about 16% of the stock market turned over every year which is an average holding period of just over five years. I don't even think you could calculate it now because you'd have to add in derivatives of, of all sorts whatsoever. But let's just say safely, the average holding period of an equity is not five years. So if we go back to a period of repression where the amount of liquidity is a reflection of the holding period, then a lot of these structures really don't work anymore. Uh, so closed down, I'm also the chairman of a, a UK listed closed down fund, closed down funds, have a better way of coping with this. That's why we always had closed end funds because there simply wasn't enough liquidity to, to do do this. And the mutual fund is actually a progression beyond the closed end fund because we lived in a world of more liquidity. And we might have to go back to looking more at closed end funds as a better way to manage capital in a low liquidity world. I trust by extension, the world of ETFs um, makes it, <laughs> takes it a whole nother level of liquidity needs yeah. than mutual funds. Absolutely. Which is and, you know, I think that's a good point because we, because let's not forget our friends, the algorithms. Uh, I don't know, I've never been for a drink with an algorithm, but anyway, I'll call them the friend anyway. What do they do in a world like this? You know, they're, they're losing liquidity, but worse than that, they mm -hmm. are basing their, the relationships between macro data and financial securities on 30 years of data, or maybe 20, or maybe 10, but, but not 100. And then suddenly these relationships that we're discussing begin to break down, the most important of all being that there is no effective market price for the risk-free rate. 
I wonder if what happens is that one day the algorithms sort of get this new data, they realize that the relationship is broken down and they all move in a different direction on the same day. So we're not just talking about waning liquidity and ETFs and mutual funds. We're also talking about those algorithms and how they might begin to react when they see a new structure developing. Uh, because I think we all know we're moving to a new structure. My views on it may be wrong, but I, you know, what happens when the algorithms work out what that structure is and how quickly do they move? And what does it mean if you're a active investor in the wrong place at the wrong time as those algorithms seek the liquidity that may not be there all at the same time? Well, there's an elephant in the room that hasn't been addressed yet, and that is this <clears throat> the closed end system of China and how it interacts with all of this and what their role is going to be as uh, over this next decade and a half. How should we be thinking about China? Yeah, so so this uh, most people watching this will be familiar with what happens when when another power rises up and you've already got one great power, and that is conflict. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean conflict on the battlefield; it just means conflict. And now we have clear evidence of that conflict in trade, conflict actually in capital flows as well. Uh, America bringing in lots of legislation to restrict the flow of capital to certain companies in China. But let's not be let's be clear about this. It's trying to act to restrict the flow of capital to China. Full stop. Is there some rapprochement that stops this? And then you kind of look at the last two months in China and think maybe because you can see some sort of backing away from some of this more confrontational stuff by Xi Jinping. Uh, my view is that that is a matter of speed rather than direction, that perhaps both sides realized this was going too quickly uh, and both sides want to slow it down, that we're not ready for two distinct systems in the world, a Chinese, Russia, and affiliate system, and an American and its affiliate system. Uh, it would be too jarring for China and I think too jarring for the rest of us if we do it today. But I think that's where we're going. Uh, I, I don't really have many doubts that that's where we're going. Uh, the question is how quickly. So Xi, I think, got a bit worried it was going too quickly and maybe slowed things down. But as an investor, you have to prepare for that. And the private sector is doing it anyway. We know the public sector is doing it in terms of promoting credit for chip plants. The, the now promotion of credit for the, I, for the IRA in America and the, the reciprocal or sort of the competing thing in, in Europe is also a new industrial policy. You know, we might think that this is all about green, but it's actually also, and you will find this also mixed in there is more Chinese independency. So you've got that drive by the governments, but behind that, I mean, really fascinating, we had uh, Christian Suing, who's the CEO of Deutsche uh, last year, saying that the reason he's got very strong demand for credit is private sector German companies rebuilding their supply lines, diversifying away from China. So can we put that genie back in the bottle? Can everybody relax again and say, it's just not going to happen? I think it's too late. I think we realize it can happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. And I don't see private sector capital flows redirecting back into China, either in the portfolio level or at a direct investment level, which is what the Germans were doing. It's possible. I mean, it, obviously it's possible, but I think it's unlikely and it's, and, it's, and it's too late. So once again, this creates huge opportunities for investors in certain types of companies that have really struggled to compete with China uh, and now find themselves being the answer to many political problems of the West having once been the problem. Uh, you know, if you make steel in America, guess what? It's a lot greener than making steel in China, but it's not green. Uh, so you can even argue there's a green agenda behind this. If you, want to, if you want to clean the economy up, buy American steel, buy Japanese steel, but don't buy Chinese steel. So I think there's a huge number of forces here to create huge opportunities. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying just in the steel industry, but in many industrial sectors that are not in people's portfolios and are certainly not in the S&P 500, there are wonderful opportunities for those stocks now to do exceptionally well as the direction of travel with China remains the same, even if the pace at which we're moving there may have temporarily slowed down. There's a small number of economists, strategists who think that the RMB would be the replacement of the dollar and as a global reserve currency. Um, what do you make of that prediction? No. So no, uh, the, the, the RMB has been open as a reserve currency, I think since 2014. That was one of the first changes in the law was actually to allow reserve managers to own PRC bonds, uh, before RMB denominated PRC bonds before the private sector. Every quarter we get data from, uh, I think it's the IMF, 
and they tell us the composition of global foreign exchange reserves. And uh, we know who owns RMB denominated PRC bonds, and that is Mr. Putin. That's it. You know, you can, you can tell from looking at the data and it doesn't really go up very much, it's tiny. So for eight years, any reserve manager in the world who wants to own them has had the choice of owning them and have chosen not to own them. Now, is there something dramatic about to change that suddenly they're going to make that difference? Well, as you know, there is speculation that Saudi in particular would begin to accept RMB in return for its oil. That's an interesting thing. And obviously it helps China a lot because the long arm of America can be held at bay if you're not transacting in dollars. But the real question about Saudi is not what it transact in renminbi, it's will it hold renminbi? You know, okay, so it gets them, but if it sells them on the international marketplace, not, you know, it's not making any difference to the dollar whatsoever. So let's see if they're about to have a vault fast. And after, uh, well, nearly eight years of being able to own RMB in the reserves, they decide that they suddenly want to own them, then I'm going to have to come back and rethink this. But I think the, the most likely thing is that they don't want to own them and they get the run them be and they sell them. So my, you know, it's a long conversation on the reserve currency status of the dollar, but I don't think it's changing. And I don't think the run them be can uh, take its place. And the situation in Russia makes that pretty clear. You know, the, when you own uh, Chinese reserves, you own RMB denominated government bonds. You could have owned Russian ruble government denominated bonds and the next day they're worthless. I mean, they have a ruble value, but they have no dollar value. Now that risk, which was theoretical, I think, is clearly come to the fore for many investors and reduces, significantly reduces the prospects that they would seek to own those government bonds. So yeah, I think Saudi can make a move to accept renminbi. I mean, maybe others can as well, but let us watch the quarterly data from the IMF and my bet is that you won't see them accumulating around the bay, in which case the dollar is unchanged in its, its role. You spent a lot of time in China. The same minority of economists that think that the RMB may someday be a uh, global reserve currency also tend to um, believe that China's economy is very strong and threatening. What is the reality of that? Well, we all know that there's been this call for years that China has a weak economy. And, and the kind of core of that is its debt to GDP ratio. And I think the data on that really speaks for itself. So if you go back to 2007, which is when it turned out America had too much debt, let's put it that way, and we rolled into 2008, 2009, China's debt to GDP ratio was roughly half America. And now it's higher. So something's fundamentally changed here. Uh, and that is that after 2009, China launched the, the biggest debt explosion in human history. That was their answer to the crisis of 2009. And it's absolutely fascinating to me that there's a great contrast to India, because you can say, well, that was the only way China could grow. But India has grown uh, and its debt to GDP ratio is up, but it's up to about 176 percent. And China is close to 290 percent. So one of the, the great fallacies in finance, actually in life, is to say, because something hasn't happened, it won't happen. Uh, and that's kind of where we got to in China now, and also the, the euros on the uh, single European currency. It hasn't happened, therefore it won't happen. But the reason it hasn't happened is you've taken more balance sheet risk. And by taking more and more balance sheet risk, you can kind of stop the inevitable until the day you can't stop the inevitable. So to be clear, I think China faces a, a debt crisis. But there is a very easy solution to a debt crisis, as you discovered in America in 2009, it's called print money. Uh, and that's what you do, and that's what they'll do. So uh, it, it leads me to have a different opinion than most people on the exchange rate, rather than on China. Uh, you know, I'm saying that the, 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 the outlook for the world is to inflate away debts, because their debt to GDP ratio is like 280% average advanced economy. China is the same. So why would I come to a different conclusion for China? It's going to do the same thing. Uh, so that's not the sort of the whole thing collapses and China is a terrible mess, but it is to suggest that the exchange rate policy is not compatible with inflating away your debts. Everybody else who's done it in the past has had a flexible exchange rate. China will need to have that as well. So China looks to me to be in a debt deflation, but uh, it was, I think, 1932, Irving Fisher published his prescription for defeating a debt, debt, debt deflation. So it's been around a long time. I don't know if it's published in Chinese, but I suspect it is. 
Uh, it's only about four pages long, and it's a tried and tested, me tested method for solving this problem. But it means higher inflation in China and a lower exchange rate. Um, you mentioned gold as an investment um, idea. What do you do as an investor when you are looking forward to 10, 10 15 years of financial repression? What assets so, are the worst performing? What are the best performing? So people might be surprised to hear me say equities as well as gold. You, you rightly, Bob, took us back to 1971 earlier on. And people will look to that period and say, well, look, <laughs> excuse me, they will say what we learned in the 70s is equities, equities don't defend you from inflation. I would disagree. The S&P did not defend you from inflation in the 1970s very clearly. Uh, but the reason was that in 1966, the Schiller PE, the cyclically adjusted PE, was 23 and a half times. And by 1982, I think it had got to seven. Now, if your valuation is going to call from 23 and a half to seven, guess what? It's highly unlikely that equities are going to give you a positive return relative to inflation. So the secret of defending yourself from inflation is don't buy equities on 23 and a half times PE, Schiller PE. So that rules out the S&P. Full stop because it's on 28. So I don't think it's going to be a place for you to, to make money. However, if we go into the rest of the world, that's not where you find equities. It, as recently as two years ago, the Morgan Stanley World Equity Index in dollar terms, so that's like everything else in the world, all the equity markets in the world in dollar terms were below, their 20, or below, below the price they were in 2000. By 2020, they'd gone nowhere in 20 years. Even today, they're only 24% higher than they were in March 2020. Now, I don't really hesitate to use the word bubble for the valuation of US equities. You know, 4.1 time book for the S&P, 4.6 times from NASDAQ. Yeah, I think you could maybe put the word bubble against that. Obviously, it has to be relative to returns, and it has to be relative to the risk-free rate. Uh, but if you go to emerging markets, they're on 1.6 times book. If you go to the United Kingdom, it's at about 1.6 times book. Most global equity markets are less than two times book. So if the future is that interest rates don't really go up, but earnings do go up, how dangerous is it to own an equity on one and a half times book with an ROE of 13, 14? Now, I'm not saying there isn't going to be volatility in that, but I think the question was really focused in the long run. And in the long run, I think there are equity markets you can own. As we discussed earlier, I think there are equity sectors you can own. And I think people might be a bit surprised to hear me say there are you know, so many equities you could have in a portfolio in a period of higher inflation. But I think that's because we're taking the, the wrong lesson from the 70s. Don't buy overvalued equities. And there only is one really big bubble in the world in terms of equity valuation, and it's the S&P. Uh, and it's not US value stocks. You know, It's not US small caps. It's not Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. So there is a portfolio you can build, in my opinion, that will defend you from inflation. Also, I think equities are underperforming when interest rates are going up. And most people think that inflate, higher inflation will always lead to higher interest rates. That will hurt equities. But if rates stay low and inflation goes up, as you pointed out, earnings and revenues should rise for those companies that can benefit from inflation. And that takes me to infrastructure companies. If, if the governments are going to be spending, what's the likelihood that this spending will be concentrated in infrastructure related and perhaps defense industries as well if there's conflicts that grow? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just it's not that difficult to look and see what the political problems are the governments need solved uh, to know that they will mobilize private sector savings in the banking system to do so and align your equity portfolio to take advantage of that. And you've already named two of them infrastructure. Let's, let's remember that a lot of this is focused on rebuilding the entire energy infrastructure to make it greener, defense. Uh, but let's not forget the big one, probably bigger than the, those other two, which is building self-reliance from China. You know, that's where the real money could be made, made now because that is such a huge task. Uh, you might think that building an energy renewable sector is a big task, but maybe making a, a, a countries independent from China is just as big. So those are three huge things. So I think you're absolutely right. And uh, you're going to get subsidized credit to do this. So the equity owner benefits immensely if you get cheap subsidized credit at a time when inflation is above the rate of interest.
So, uh, you, you know, this is a political economy we're looking at here. You know, I did say at the beginning, this is a transformation in the way the whole thing works. Political economy becomes important. Uh, you may be of a school of thought that says that that's a disgusting business to get involved with. Well, welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> um, Bitcoin is something of an economic religion. There are a lot of people that believe that this is the first money that can't be controlled by human beings. And a lot of the scenario would point people towards wanting to own Bitcoin as well as gold. What's your view of the role of these um, and particularly Bitcoin, because the others are, have a different role. But um, is there any role for Bitcoin in the future? Is, does it does it does it provide some uh, benefit, economic benefit, by transmitting value instantaneously at low cost? Uh, no, not Bitcoin, but stablecoin does. I, I think it, I think people need to think about this carefully. Governments will not be that in favor of Bitcoin because it can happen surreptitiously, but also it's a con private sector control of money. And the whole point about a financial recession is to have more public sector control of money. You know, if I discussed earlier, you're taking power from the central bank. So you really don't want a competitor. Uh, America's had competitors before. I mean, uh, Andrew Jackson was pretty big on his wildcat banking, right? When anybody could make up their own currency and, uh, and many people did. And Scotland for many years had free, uh, free banking and it made up its own currency. Uh, but the, the problem for Bitcoin is stablecoin. If you are the government and you want that instantaneous movement of money, which is you know brings huge benefits, why not stablecoin, a regulated stablecoin? Because what is the one asset, the only really one asset that a regulated stablecoin could possibly own? The answer is short-term government debt. Now, as a government, I'm going to like that. So if that that can so the one function that you've mentioned, which I think is an important function, that can be provided by stablecoin. That doesn't change the world just ties that particular currency to another government liability. Uh, so what does that leave for Bitcoin? You know, is it a means of transaction, a store of value or a unit of account? And I think probably not. So, you know, my view is it'll probably be like a baseball card, but not quite as beautiful. Right. Um, you talked about digital assets and the three types. Um, we missed the other one, which is mm. central bank and CBDCs. <clears throat> Excuse me. What? What role will that play? China's been working on it pretty aggressively. So this is the greatest threat to liberty in the world today. And that, that's, that's a big statement, given the threats to liberty there are out there. But a central bank digital currency in which all of us decided to hold rather than commercial bank deposits would have the central bank then allocating those deposits back to the commercial banks to lend out, it's very unlikely that the, commercial, the central bank would want to be in the lending business, but you never know, maybe it would. But anyway, if it didn't want to be in that business, and now it completely controls the flow of credit through the entire system. One central bank, uh, it's kind of shocking and scary. Uh, the good news is the central bankers know that. Uh, and the, the kind of must read article is written by August Karstens, I think it's February, 2021, uh, just explaining why central banks have to be very careful about the size of the CBDC. So, you know, obviously they're going to be, they're going to be there and they're being discussed, but they could restrict the size of them just in case we get to this stage where you and I decide to hold that form of liquidity and all power of the flow of credit flows to government appointed officials who run a central bank. Uh, as you may have guessed through our conversation so far, Bob, I'm not a great fan of central bankers' ability to do much. But the idea that they'd be allocating all the credit in the uh, in the system based upon some academic papers they'd written two years beforehand uh, sends a big shiver down my spine. So I think we're wise enough not to do it. But if you see a country that wants to do it in size, what it's telling you is it wants to run a command economy. Full stop. So if China really wants to get this to be a big thing, it's telling you that, you know, I know they own the banks anyway. But they want even bigger control over the allocation of credit. And that is not a system that anybody with private sector capital should be involved in. You should be leaving it. So let's see how if Japan, if China wants to push the envelope on making this bigger. But I think most countries will go with a small experiment and not go further. Uh, but if they uh, if they go further, we have a lot more to worry about than money if the central bank digital currency is going to take over bank deposits. Um, going back to the whole idea of global credit, um, it's been expanding for 35, 40 years or more um, about that. Um, how 
why is it that what happened that makes this urgent today and why can't it go on for another few decades before we reach this point yeah so the, i mean the biggest question in finance in my entire career is when is too much debt too much debt because mm -hmm. um, it's been going up and up and we never really had a good answer to it uh the best objective uh, test I've seen on this is put together by the Bank of International Settlements who have created a thing called the Early Warning Indicator. And their Early Warning Indicator is the trend is the current rate of growth in debt to GDP relative to trend. So BIS, EWI, people can Google it, come to their own conclusions, but it's got, it's got you know, and obviously they're back tested uh, and it's got some, you know, it's got some predictive capacity. So that's obviously suggesting that we've got a problem. For me, I'm looking at that plus another data point, which is these private sector debt service ratios. I mean, the history of the data, we, you know, we got good data back to 98. And what it says is if the private sector debt service ratio is around 20% or above and rates go up, then the private sector has got a problem. Not guaranteed problem, but you know, there's a heightened risk of a problem. And that is where yes. we are. Mm -hmm. That is where we are across the most of the developed world. So that is what tells me that today too much debt is too much debt. And it's also worth pointing out that every time we have a recession, it looks like the whole world's going bankrupt. This is a pretty good asset test that perhaps there's too much debt. Uh, you know, we have to get rates to zero. We have to provide private sector gar guarantees on private sector. Just the asset test is that you know, recessions create so much damage that we've got too much debt. So that's it. That's why I think now today, too much debt is too much debt, but really worth stressing that emerging markets, it isn't, they just don't have that level of debt. So it's another reason to, to look in there and have a better look. And I guess one of the urgencies is that inflation just suddenly appeared um, a year and a half ago or whenever it was, a couple of years ago, and that that's put an inordinate pressure on central banks to shift their policies. Um, what um, what do you think caused that? And what is it that you, do you have a forecast for whether inflation is going to be stubbornly worse in the next 12 to 24 months? There is a school of salt. As inflation is everywhere at all times, a monetary phenomenon. Uh, we did have a huge surge in money supply growth. It seems to have disappeared. I'm a little bit skeptical about it, you know, because it's, you know, America publishes an M2. I wonder if it was publishing an M3 and an M4, whether it would have disappeared. Maybe there's some money sort of going further out the maturity spectrum. But anyway, you do not expect inflation to come down if you've had that huge hump in money supply and it's come off. So it should genuinely be coming down. The point is, the whole point of financial repression is we can't allow it to. Not that we can't allow it to go from 10 to 8 to 6, because of course we can't. <clears throat> We can't allow it to get back to two. I mean, the reason we're in this mess is that we give central bankers this target of two. And against that background of trying to hit two, they kept taking rates to extremely low levels and producing more gearing. So that's the world that we used to live in. And if we are rapidly heading down towards there, something will be done to, to, to stop it. That may be government intervention rather than central bank intervention. But if you believe in financial repression, you believe inflation of four to six, really because it's only inflation at four to six, that's really over that 10, 12, 13 year period that's going to get us out of this. And if, if for some reason there's not enough money in the system to give us that level, then the governments will create it. And you know the mechanism for doing that is crystal clear because we did it before. Control the growth in buying credit, control the growth in money. And that will, that is passing to the government and it would accelerate if inflation comes down too quickly and real rates go up too fast and we get back into another private sector credit crisis. And for the next decade, you're thinking that it'll average 400 basis points or so, the spread between inflation and, and the cost of money? It, it's, I mean, that's pure guesswork. And it's, again, and it's, I mean, I, I like to call financial repression stealing money from old people slowly. And the 4% is on this, is, is really aimed at the slowly bit. You, you mustn't frighten the horses too much. So that's, <laughs> why, that's why I go for that number. Because what do horses do if you frighten them? They stampede, right? And stampede is money leaving the country. Stampede is a much higher velocity of money. So, uh, you know, obviously, if it comes to stampeding horses, if you're the government and you don't want horses stampeded, I'm public enemy number one. But uh, assuming I survive this, Bob, the, uh, that's why you go for four. Because if it's six or eight, I, don't th I think you're going to frighten the horses. And what we've learned from the history of inflation is there's two bits of that, money and velocity. Controlling money is not that difficult. Controlling velocity, whew, that's a biggie.
And one, one could easily argue that, that was what, that's why Volcker had to do what Volcker did. It was because the velocity of money was so high. The way you and I used money at that time was so different from the way we use it today. So I think it'll towards the lower end of the range. Otherwise, you risk losing control of the velocity of money. Not, not to mention the low amount of debt to GDP in the 1970s and the high amount of debt to GDP in, in today's world. Absolutely right. People say, you know, when is Paul going to do a Volcker? Well, maybe when he's a debt to GDP ratio of 120%. He's starting at 285, so uh, that's a bit of a challenge. Um, Russell, uh, where can we send folks who want to subscribe to your newsletter? Well, for institutions um, who are regulated, that would be on ERIC, Russell Napier and the E-R-I-C, ERIC, which is a place for the sale of independent research. I founded back in 2014. Uh, we are a band of band of independent research brothers out there. Uh, you can find us on ERIC. Uh, but if you're an individual, there is my own name, russellnapier.co.uk, and there is a product available uh, under the regulatory regime for individuals, and uh, you can find it there. Uh, I also, and uh, you know, I could plug for a long time, Bob, but let me just mention the course because we've put it online. Oh, great. A long time. Yeah. So, and it's selling really well. So the Advanced Valuation in Financial Markets, the Dasco Education Company, uh, you can find an online version of our, uh, of our course, which, you know, it goes under two names, actually, Practical History of Financial Markets, Advanced Valuation in Financial Markets, same course, different name. You can find it at the dascoeducation.org. And maybe you want to do that. I mean, the world is changing. Uh, it's not about numbers anymore. Uh, and if I can quote from the great, the greatest work on central banking actually was the Wizard of Oz. So if I can quote from Dorothy, we're certainly not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Russell, thank you so much. It has been really educational and also entertaining. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Cheers. Have a good weekend. Thank you.